Section 49 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.63 Some Consolation to Mankind Of the Federation feast itself we shall say almost nothing. There are tents pitched in the Champ de Mars, tent for National Assembly, tent for hereditary representative, who indeed is there too early and has to wait long in it. There are 83 symbolical departmental trees of liberty, trees and may, enough. Beautifulest of all these is one huge may, hung round with effete scutcheons, emblazonries and genealogy books, nay better still, with lawyer's bags, sac de procédure, which shall be burnt. The thirty seat rows of that famed slope are again full. We have a bright sun, and all is marching, streamering, and blaring. But what avails it? Virtuous Mayor Petion, whom Fouillantism has suspended, was reinstated only last night by decree of the Assembly. Men's humour is of the sourest. Men's hats have on them, written in chalk, Vive Petion, and even... Pétion or death, pétion ou la mort. Poor Louis, who has waited till five o'clock before the assembly would arrive, swears the national oath this time, with a quilted cuirass under his waistcoat, which will turn pistol bullets. Madame de Stael, from that royal tent, stretches out the neck in a kind of agony, lest the waving multitudes which receive him may not render him back alive. No cry of Vive le Roi salutes the ear, cries only of Vive Pétion, Pétion au la mort. The national solemnity is as it were huddled by, each cowering off, almost before the evolutions are gone through. The very May, with its scutcheons and lawyers' bags, is forgotten, stands unburnt, till certain patriot deputies, called by the people, set a torch to it, by way of voluntary afterpiece. Sadder feast of pikes no man ever saw. Mayor Petion, named on hats, is at his zenith in this federation. Lafayette again is close upon his nadir. Why does the storm bell of Saint Roche speak out next Saturday? Why do the citizens shut their shops? It is sections defiling. It is fear of effervescence. Legislative committee, long deliberating on Lafayette and that anti-Jacobin visit of his, reports this day that there is not ground for accusation. Peace, ye patriots, nevertheless, and let that toxin cease. The debate is not finished, nor the report accepted. But Brissot, Isnar, and the Mountain will sift it, and re-sift it, perhaps for some three weeks longer. So many bells, storm bells, and noises do ring, scarcely audible, one drowning the other. For example, in this same Lafayette toxin of Saturday, was there not withal some faint Bob Minor and deputation of legislative bringing the Chevalier Paul Jones to his long rest, toxin or dirge now all one to him? Not ten days hence, Patriot Brissot, beshouted this day by the Patriot galleries, shall find himself begroaned by them on account of his limited patriotism, nay, pelted at while perorating and hit with two prunes. It is a distracted, empty-sounding world of Bob Miners and Bob Majors, of triumph and terror, of rise and fall. The more touching is this other solemnity which happens on the morrow of the Lafayette toxin, Proclamation that the country is in danger. Not till the present Sunday could such solemnity be. The legislative decreed it almost a fortnight ago, but royalty and the ghost of a ministry held back as they could. Now, however, on this Sunday, 22nd day of July, 1792, it will hold back no longer, and the solemnity in very deed is. Touching to behold. Municipality and mayor have on their scarfs. Cannon salvo booms alarm from the Pont Neuf, and single gun at intervals all day. 
guards are mounted, scarfed nobilities, halberdiers, and a cavalcade, with streamers, emblematic flags, especially with one huge flag, flapping mournfully. Citoyen, la patrie est en danger. They roll through the streets with stern-sounding music and slow rattle of hoofs, pausing at set stations and with doleful blast of trumpets singing out through herald's throat what the flag says to the eye. Citizens, the country is in danger. Is there a man's heart that hears it without a thrill? The many-voiced responsive hum or bellow of these multitudes is not of triumph, and yet it is a sound deeper than triumph. But when the long cavalcade and proclamation ended, and our huge flag was fixed on the Pont Neuf, another like it on the Hôtel de Ville, to wave there till better days, and each municipal sat in the centre of his section, in a tent raised in some open square, tent surmounted with flags of patrie en danger, and topmost of all, a pike and bonnet rouge. And on two drums in front of him there lay a plank table, and on this an open book, and a clerk sat, like recording angel, ready to write the lists, or, as we say, to enlist. Oh, then it seems the very gods might have looked down on it. Young patriotism, colotic and sans colotic, rushes forward, emulous. That is my name. Name, blood and life is all my country's. Why have I nothing more? Youths of short stature weep that they are below size. Old men come forward, a son in each hand. Mothers themselves will grant the son of their travail. Send him, though with tears. And the multitude bellows, Vive la patrie! Far reverberating. And fire flashes in the eyes of men. And at eventide, your municipal returns to the town hall, followed by his long train of volunteer valour, hands in his list, says proudly, looking round, This is my day's harvest. They will march on the morrow to Soissons, small bundle holding all their chattels. So with Vive la Patrie, Vive la Liberté, Stone Paris reverberates like Ossian in his caves, day after day. Municipals enlisting in tricolour tent, the flag flapping on Pont Neuf and Town Hall. Citoyen, la Patrie est en danger. Some ten thousand fighters, without discipline but full of heart, are on march in few days. The like is doing in every town of France. Consider, therefore, whether the country will want defenders, had we but a national executive. Let the sections and primary assemblies, at any rate, become permanent, and sit continually in Paris and over France by legislative decree dated Wednesday the 25th. Mark contrariwise how, in these very hours, dated the 25th, Brunswick shakes himself, s'ébrang, in Koblenz, and takes the road, shakes himself indeed. One spoken word becomes such a shaking. Successive, simultaneous, dural, of thirty thousand muskets shouldered, prance and jingle of ten thousand horsemen, fanfaronading emigrants in the van, drum, kettle drum, noise of weeping, swearing, and the immeasurable lumbering clank of baggage wagons and camp kettles that groan into motion. All this is Brunswick shaking himself. Not without all this does the one man march, covering a space of forty miles, still less without his manifesto, dated, as we say, the 25th, a state paper worthy of attention. By this document, it would seem great things are in store for France. The universal French people shall now have permission to rally round Brunswick and his emigrant seigneur. Tyranny of a Jacobin faction shall oppress them no more, but they shall return and find favour with their own good king, who, by royal declaration three years ago of the 23rd of June, said that he would himself make them happy. As for National Assembly and other bodies of men invested with some temporary shadow of authority, they are charged to maintain the king's cities and strong places intact, till Brunswick arrive to take delivery of them. Indeed, quick submission may extenuate many things. 
but to this end it must be quick. Any National Guard or other unmilitary person found resisting in arms shall be treated as a traitor, that is to say, hanged with promptitude. For the rest, if Paris, before Brunswick gets thither, offer any insult to the king, or, for example, suffer a faction to carry the king away elsewhere, in that case Paris shall be blasted asunder with cannon shot and military execution. Likewise, all other cities, which may witness and not resist to the uttermost such forced march of his majesty, shall be blasted asunder, and Paris and every city of them, starting place, course, and goal of said sacrilegious forced march, shall, as rubbish and smoking ruin, lie there for a sign. Such vengeance were indeed signal, an insigne vengeance. O oh, Brunswick, what words thou writest and blusterest! In this Paris, as in old Nineveh, are so many score thousands that know not the right hand from the left, and also much cattle. Shall the very milk cows, hard-living cadgers, asses, and poor little canary birds die? Nor is royal and imperial Prussian-Austrian declaration wanting, setting forth in the amplest manner their sans souci Schönbrunn version of this whole French revolution, since the first beginning of it, and with what grief these high heads have seen such things done under the sun. However, as some small consolation to mankind, they do now dispatch Brunswick, regardless of expense, as one might say, of sacrifices on their own part, for is it not the first duty to console men? Serene Highnesses, who sit there protocoling and manifestoing, and consoling mankind, how were it if for once in the thousand years your apartments, formularies, and reasons of state were blown to the four winds, and reality, sans indispensables, stared you, even you, in the face, and mankind said for itself what the thing was that would console it? End of section 49section 50 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter 2.64 subterranean but judge if there was comfort in this to the sections all sitting permanent deliberating how a national executive could be put in action high rises the response not of cackling terror, but of crowing counter-defiance, and vive la nation, young valour streaming towards the frontiers, patrie en danger, mutely beckoning on the Pont Neuf. Sections are busy in their permanent deep, and down lower still works unlimited patriotism, seeking salvation in plot. Insurrection, you would say, becomes once more the sacredest of duties. Committee, self-chosen, is sitting at the sign of the Golden Sun. Journalist Cara, Camille Desmoulin, Alsatian Westerman, friend of Danton, American Fournier of Martinique, a committee not unknown to Mayor Petion, who, as an official person, must sleep with one eye open. Not unknown to Procureur Manuel, least of all to Procureur Substitute Danton. He, wrapped in darkness, being also official, bears it on his giant shoulder, cloudy invisible atlas of the whole. Much is invisible. The very Jacobins have their reticences. Insurrection is to be, but when? This only we can discern, that such fédérés as are not yet gone to Soissons, as indeed are not inclined to go yet, for reasons, says the Jacobin president, which it may be interesting not to state, have got a central committee sitting close by, under the roof of the Mother Society herself. Also, what in such ferment and danger of effervescence is surely proper, the 48 sections have got their central committee, intended for prompt communication, 
to which central committee the municipality, anxious to have it at hand, could not refuse an apartment in the Hôtel de Ville. Singular city, for overhead of all this there is the customary baking and brewing, labour hammers and grinds, frilled promenaders saunter under the trees, white muslin promenaderess in green parasol leaning on your arm, dogs dance and shoeblacks polish on that pont neuf itself where fatherland is in danger. So much goes its course, and yet the course of all things is nigh altering and ending. Look at that Tuileries and Tuileries garden, silent all as Sahara, none entering save by ticket. They shut their gates after the day of the black breeches, a thing they had the liberty to do. However, the National Assembly grumbled something about Terrace of the Fouillon, how said Terrace lay contiguous to the back entrance to their salle and was partly national property. And so now national justice has stretched a trickler ribband athwart by way of boundary line, respected with splenetic strictness by all patriots. It hangs there, that trickler boundary line, carries satirical inscriptions on cards, generally in verse. And all beyond this is called Koblenz, and remains vacant, silent as a fateful Golgotha, sunshine and umbrage alternating on it in vain. Fateful circuit, what hope can dwell in it? Mysterious tickets of entry introduce themselves, speak of insurrection very imminent. Rivarol's staff of genius had better purchase blunderbusses. Grenadier bonnets, red Swiss uniforms may be useful. Insurrection will come, but likewise will it not be met? Staved off, one may hope, till Brunswick arrive. But consider withal, if the burnstones and portable chairs remain silent, if the Herald's College of Billstickers sleep. Louvet's Sentinelle warns gratis on all walls. Soulot is busy. People's friend Marat and King's friend Royal croak and counter croak. For the man Marat, though long hidden since that Champ de Mars massacre, is still alive. He has lain who knows in what cellars, perhaps in Le Gendre's, fed by a stake of Le Gendre's killing. But since April, the bullfrog voice of him sounds again, hoarsest of earthly cries. For the present, black terror haunts him. O oh, brave Barbaro, wilt thou not smuggle me to Marseille, disguised as a jockey? In Palais Royal and all public places, as we read, there is sharp activity, private individuals haranguing that valour may enlist haranguing that the executive may be put in action. Royalist journals ought to be solemnly burnt. Argument thereupon. Debates which generally end in single stick coup de can. Or think of this, the hour midnight, place salle de manege, august assembly just adjourning. Citizens of both sexes enter in a rush, exclaiming, Vengeance! They are poisoning our brothers! baking braid glass among their bread at Soissons. Vergniaud has to speak soothing words, how commissioners are already sent to investigate this braid glass and do what is needful therein, till the rush of citizens makes profound silence and goes home to its bed. Such is Paris, the heart of a France like to it, preternatural suspicion, doubt, disquietude, nameless anticipation, from shore to shore. And those black-browed Marseillaise, marching, dusty, unwearied, through the midst of it, not doubtful they, marching to the grim music of their hearts, they consume continually the long road, these three weeks and more, heralded by terror and rumour. The Brest Fédéré arrive on the 26th through harrying streets. Determined men are these also, bearing or not bearing the sacred pikes of Chateau Vieux, and on the whole decidedly disinclined for Soissons as yet. Surely the Marseillaise brethren do draw nigher all days.
End of section 50. Section 51 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.65 At Dinner It was a bright day for Charenton, that 29th of the month, when the Marseillese brethren actually came in sight. Barbaro, Santerre, and Patriots have gone out to meet the grim wayfarers. Patriot clasps dusty Patriot to his bosom. There is foot washing and refection. Dinner of twelve hundred covers at the Blue Dial, Cadran Bleu, and deep interior consultation that one wots not of. Consultation indeed which comes to little, for Santerre with an open purse with a loud voice has almost no head. Here, however, we repose this night. On the morrow is public entry into Paris. On which public entry the day historians, diurnalistes, or journalists, as they call themselves, have preserved record enough. How Saint Antoine, male and female, and Paris generally, gave brotherly welcome with bravo and hand clapping in crowded streets, and all passed in peaceablest manner. Except it might be our Marseillaise pointed out here and there a ribboned cockade, and beckoned that it should be snatched away, and exchanged for a wool one, which was done. How the mother society in a body has come as far as the Bastille ground to embrace you. How you then wend onwards triumphant to the town hall to be embraced by Mayor Pétion, to put down your muskets in the barracks of Nouvelle France, not far off then towards the appointed tavern in the Champs-Élysées to enjoy a frugal patriot repast, of all which the indignant Tuileries may, by its tickets of entry, have warning. Red Swiss look doubly sharp to their chateau gratte, though surely there is no danger. Blue grenadiers of the Fille Saint-Thomas section are on duty there this day. Men of Agio, as we have seen, with stuffed purses, Riband cockades, among whom serves Weber. A party of these latter, with captains, with sundry Fouillon notabilities, Moreau de Saint-Marie, of the three thousand orders, and others, have been dining, much more respectably, in a tavern hard by. They have dined, and are now drinking loyal patriotic toasts, while the Marseillaise, national patriotic merely, are about sitting down to their frugal covers of Delph. How it happened remains to this day undemonstrable, but the external fact is, certain of these Fille Saint Thomas grenadiers do issue from their tavern, perhaps touched, surely not yet muddled with any liquor they have had, issue in the professed intention of testifying to the Marseillaise, or to the multitude of Paris patriots who stroll in these spaces that they, the Fille Saint Thomas men, if well seen into, are not a whit less patriotic than any other class of men whatever. It was a rash errand. For how can the strolling multitudes credit such a thing, or do other indeed than hoot at it, provoking and provoked, till grenadier sabres stir in the scabbard, and a sharp shriek rises, A nous Marseillais, help Marseillais. Quick as lightning, for the frugal repast is not yet served, that Marseillaise tavern flings itself open. By door, by window, running, bounding, vault forth the five hundred and seventeen undined patriots, and, sabre flashing from thigh, are on the scene of controversy. Will ye parley, ye grenadier captains and official persons, with faces grown suddenly pale, the deponents say? Advisabler were instant, moderately swift retreat. The Fille Saint Thomas retreat, back foremost, then, alas, face foremost, at treble quick time. The Marseillaise, according to a deponent, clearing the fences and ditches after them like lions. Monsieur, it was an imposing spectacle. Thus they retreat, the Marseillaise following. Swift and swifter, towards the Tuileries, 
where the drawbridge receives the bulk of the fugitives, and then suddenly drawn up, saves them, or else the green mud of the ditch does it. The bulk of them, not all. Ah, uh, no. Moreau de Saint-Marie, for example, being too fat, could not fly fast. He got a stroke, flat stroke only, over the shoulder blades, and fell prone, and disappears there from the history of the revolution. Cuts also there were, pricks in the posterior fleshy parts, much rending off skirts and other discrepant waist. But poor sub-lieutenant de Amel, innocent change-broker, what a lot for him! He turned on his pursuer, or pursuers, with a pistol. He fired and missed drew a second pistol, and again fired and missed, then ran, unhappily, in vain. In the Rue Saint-Florentin, they clutched him, thrust him through, in red rage. That was the end of the new era, and of all eras, to poor de Amel. Pacific readers can fancy what sort of grace before meat this was to frugal patriotism. Also how the battalion of the Fils saint Thomas drew out in arms, luckily without further result. How there was accusation at the bar of the assembly, and counter-accusation and defence, Marseillaise challenging the sentence of free jury court, which never got to a decision. We ask rather what the upshot of all these distracted, wildly accumulating things may, by probability, be some upshot, and the time draws nigh. Busy are central committees of Federé at the Jacobin Church, of sections at the Town Hall, reunion of Cara, Camille, and company at the Golden Sun. Busy, like submarine deities, or call them mud gods, working there in the deep murk of waters till the thing be ready. And how your National Assembly like a ship waterlogged, helmless, lies tumbling, the galleries of shrill women of Federé with sabres bellowing down on it, not unfrightful, and waits where the waves of chance may please to strand it, suspicious, nay, on the left side, conscious, what submarine explosion is meanwhile a-charging. Petition for King's forfeiture rises often there, Petition from Paris section, from provincial patriot towns, from Alençon, Briançon, and the traders at the fair of Beaucaire. Or what of these? On the 3rd of August, Mayor Petion and the municipality come petitioning for forfeiture, they openly, in their tricolour municipal scarfs. Forfeiture is what all patriots now want and expect. All Brissotins want forfeiture, with the little Prince Royal for king, and us for protector over him. Emphatic Federé ask the legislature, can you save us or not? Forty-seven sections have agreed to forfeiture, only that of the Fille saint Thomas pretending to disagree. Nay, section Moconseil declares forfeiture to be, properly speaking, come. Moconseil, for one, does from this day, the last of July, cease allegiance to Louis, and take minute of the same before all men. A thing blamed aloud, but which will be praised aloud, and the name Moconsei, of ill counsel, be thenceforth changed to Bon Conseil, of good counsel. President Danton, in the Cordelier section, does another thing, invites all passive citizens to take place among the active in section business, one peril threatening all. Thus he, though an official person, cloudy atlas of the whole, likewise he manages to have that black-browed battalion of Marseillaise shifted to new barracks in his own region of the remote southeast. Sleek Chomet, cruel Bio, Deputy Chabot the disfrocked, Huguenin, with the toxin in his heart, will welcome them there. Wherefore, again and again, O oh, legislators, can you save us or not? Poor legislators, with their legislature waterlogged, 
volcanic explosion charging under it. Forfeiture shall be debated on the ninth day of August. That miserable business of Lafayette may be expected to terminate on the eighth. Or will the humane reader glance into the levee day of Sunday the fifth, the last levee, not for a long time, never, says Bertrand Molville, had a levee been so brilliant, at least so crowded. A sad presaging interest sat on every face. Bertrand's own eyes were filled with tears. For indeed, outside of that tricolor ribbon on the Fuyon's terrace, legislature is debating, sections are defiling, all Paris is astir this very Sunday, demanding déchéance. Here, however, within the ribbon, a grand proposal is on foot, for the hundredth time, of carrying His Majesty to Rouen and the castle of Gaillon. Swiss at Courbevoie are in readiness. Much is ready. Majesty himself seems almost ready. Nevertheless, for the hundredth time, Majesty, when near the point of action, draws back, writes after one has waited, palpitating an endless summer day, that he has reason to believe the insurrection is not so ripe as you suppose, whereat Bertrand Monville breaks forth into extremity at one of spleen and despair, d'humeur et de désespoir. End of section 51section fifty two of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point six six the steeples at midnight for in truth the insurrection is just about ripe thursday is the ninth of the month august if forfeiture be not pronounced by the legislature that day, we must pronounce it ourselves. Legislature, a poor waterlogged legislature, can pronounce nothing. On Wednesday the 8th, after endless oratory once again, they cannot even pronounce accusation against Lafayette, but absolve him, hear it, patriotism, by a majority of two to one. Patriotism hears it, Patriotism, hounded on by Prussian terror, by preternatural suspicion, roars, tumultuous, round the salle de manege, all day, insults many leading deputies of the absolvent right side, nay chases them, collars them with loud menace. Deputy Vaublanc and others of the like are glad to take refuge in guard houses and escape by the back window. And so, next day, there is infinite complaint, letter after letter from insulted deputy, mere complaint, debate, and self-cancelling jargon. The sun of Thursday sets, like the others, and no forfeiture pronounced. Wherefore, in fine, to your tents, O Israel. The Mother Society ceases speaking, groups cease haranguing, patriots with closed lips now, take one another's arm, walk off in rows two and two at a brisk business pace and vanish afar in the obscure places of the East. Santerre is ready, or we will make him ready. Forty-seven of the forty-eight sections are ready. Nay, Fille Saint-Thomas itself turns up the Jacobin side of it, turns down the Fuyon side of it, and is ready too. Let the unlimited patriot Look to his weapon, be it pike, be it firelock, and the breast brethren above all, the black browed Marseillaise, prepare themselves for the extreme hour. Sandique Rudeleur knows, and laments, or not, as the issue may turn, that five thousand ball cartridges within these few days have been distributed to Federé at the Hôtel de Ville. And ye likewise, gallant gentlemen, defenders of royalty, crowd ye on your side to the Tuileries, not to a levee, no, to a coucher, where much will be put to bed. Your tickets of entry are needful, needfuler your blunderbusses. They come and crowd like gallant men who also know how to die. Old Maillet, 
The camp marshal has come, his eyes gleaming once again, though dimmed by the room of almost fourscore years. Courage, brothers, we have a thousand red Swiss, men staunch of heart, steadfast as the granite of their Alps. National grenadiers are at least friends of order. Commandant Monda breathes loyal ardour, will answer for it on his head. Monda will, and his staff. For the staff, though there stands a doom and decree to that effect, is happily never yet dissolved. Commandant Monda has corresponded with Mayor Petion, carries a written order from him these three days, to repel force by force. A squadron on the Pont Neuf, with cannon, shall turn back these Marseillais, coming across the river. A squadron at the town hall shall cut Saint-Antoine in two, as it issues from the Arcade Saint-Jean. Drive one half back to the obscure east, drive the other half forward through the wickets of the Louvre. Squadrons not a few, and mounted squadrons, squadrons in the Palais Royal, in the Place Vendôme. All these shall charge at the right moment, sweep this street, and then sweep that. Some new twentieth of June we shall have, only still more ineffectual. Or, probably, the insurrection will not dare to rise at all. Monda's squadrons, horse gendarmerie, and blue guards march, clattering, tramping. Monda's cannoneers rumble. Under cloud of night, to the sound of his general, which begins drumming when men should go to bed. It is the ninth night of August, 1792. On the other hand, the forty-eight sections correspond by swift messengers, are choosing each their three delegates with full power. Sandique Rodereur, Mayor Petion, are sent for to the Tuileries. Courageous legislators, when the drum beats danger, should repair to their salle. Demoiselle Terroin has on her grenadier bonnet, short-skirted riding habit. Two pistols garnish her small waist, and sabre hangs in baldric by her side. Such a game is playing in this Paris pandemonium, or city of all the devils. And yet the night, as Mayor Petion walks here in the Tuileries Garden, is beautiful and calm. Orion and the Pleiades glitter down quite serene. Petion has come forth. The heat inside was so oppressive. Indeed, His Majesty's reception of him was of the roughest, as it well might be. And now there is no outgate. Monda's blue squadrons turn you back at every gate. Nay, the Fee Saint Thomas grenadiers give themselves liberties of tongue. How a virtuous mayor shall pay for it, if there be mischief, and the like. Though others again are full of civility. Surely if any man in France is in straits this night, it is Mayor Petion, bound, under pain of death, one may say, to smile dexterously with the one side of his face and weep with the other. Death, if he do it not dexterously enough. Not till four in the morning does a National Assembly, hearing of his plight, summon him over to give account of Paris, of which he knows nothing whereby, however, he shall get home to bed, and only his gilt coach be left. Scarcely less delicate is Sandic Rodereur's task, who must wait whether he will lament or not, till he see the issue. Janus, Bifron, or Mr. Facing Both Ways, as vernacular Bunyan has it, they walk there, in the meanwhile, these two Januses, with others of the like double conformation, and talk of indifferent matters. Rodereur, from time to time, steps in to listen, to speak, to send for the department directory itself, he their procureur syndic, not seeing how to act. The apartments are all crowded, some seven hundred gentlemen in black, elbowing, bustling, red Swiss standing like rocks, ghost or partial ghost of a ministry, with Rodereur and advisers, hovering round their majesties, old Marshal Maillet kneeling at the king's feet, to say, he and these gallant gentlemen are come to die for him. List, through the placid midnight, clang of the distant storm-bell. 
So, in very sooth, steeple after steeple takes up the wondrous tale. Black courtier, listen at the windows, opened for air. Discriminate the steeple bells. This is the tocsin of Saint Roche. That again, is it not Saint Jacques, named de la Boucherie? Yes, monsieur. Or even Saint Germain l'Auxerrois. Hear ye it not? The same metal that rang storm two hundred and twenty years ago, but by a majesty's order then, on St. Bartholomew's Eve. So go the steeple bells, which courtier can discriminate. Nay, meseems there is the town hall itself. We know it by its sound. Yes, friends, that is the town hall, discoursing so to the night. Miraculously, by miraculous metal tongue and man's arm. Marat himself, if you knew it, is pulling at the rope there. Marat is pulling. Robespierre lies deep, invisible for the next forty hours. And some men have heart, and some have as good as none. And not even frenzy will give them any. What struggling confusion, as the issue slowly draws on, and the doubtful hour, with pain and blind struggle, brings forth its certainty, never to be abolished. The full power delegates, three from each section, a hundred and forty-four in all, got gathered at the town hall about midnight. Monda's squadron stationed there did not hinder their entering. Are they not the central committee of the sections, who sit here usually, though in greater number tonight? They are there, presided by confusion, irresolution, and the clack of tongues. Swift scouts fly, rumour buzzes of black courtier, red Swiss, of Manda and his squadrons that shall charge. Better put off the insurrection? Yes, put it off. Ha, hark! Saint Antoine booming out eloquent tocsin of its own accord. Friends, no, ye cannot put off the insurrection, but must put it on, and live with it, or die with it. Swift now, therefore, let these actual old municipals, on sight of the full powers and mandate of the sovereign elective people, lay down their functions, and this new hundred and forty-four take them up. Will ye, nil ye, worthy old municipals, go ye must. Nay, is it not a happiness for many a municipal that he can wash his hands of such a business, and sit there paralysed, unaccountable, till the hour do bring forth, or even go home to his night's rest. Two only of the old, or at most three, we retain Mayor Petion, for the present walking in the Tuileries, Procureur Manuel, Procureur Substitute Danton, Invisible Atlas of the Whole, and so with our hundred and forty-four, among whom are a toxin Huguenin, a Bilo, a Chomette, and editor Tanion, and Fabre de Glantine, sergeants, panisse, and in brief, either emergent or else emerged and full-blown, the entire flower of unlimited patriotism. Have we not, as by magic, made a new municipality, ready to act in the unlimited manner, and declare itself roundly in a state of insurrection? First of all, then, be Commandant Monda sent for, with that mayor's order of his, also let the new municipals visit those squadrons that were to charge, and let the storm-bell ring its loudest. And on the whole, forward, ye hundred and forty-four, retreat is now none for you. Reader, fancy not, in thy languid way, that insurrection is easy. Insurrection is difficult, each individual uncertain even of his next neighbour, totally uncertain of his distant neighbours. What strength is with him? What strength is against him? Certain only that, in case of failure, his individual portion is the gallows. Eight hundred thousand heads, and in each of them a separate estimate of these uncertainties, a separate theorem of action conformable to that. Out of so many uncertainties does the certainty and inevitable net result, never to be abolished, go on at all moments bodying itself forth, leading thee also towards civic crowns or an ignominious noose. Could the reader take an asmodeus flight, and waving open all roofs and privacies, 
Look down from the tower of Notre Dame. What a Paris were it! Of treble voice whimperings or vehemence, of bass voice growlings, jubitations, courage screwing itself to desperate defiance, cowardice trembling silent within barred doors, and all round dullness, calmly snoring, for much dullness flung on its mattresses always sleeps. Oh, between the clangour of these high-storming toxins and that snore of dullness, what a gamut! Of trepidation, excitation, desperation, and above it mere doubt, danger, atropos, and knocks. Fighters of this section draw out, hear that the next section does not, and thereupon draw in. Saint Antoine, on this side of the river, is uncertain of Saint Marceau on that. Steady only is the snore of dullness, are the six hundred Marseillese that know how to die. Monda, twice summoned to the town hall, has not come. Scouts fly incessant in distracted haste, and the many whispering voices of rumour. Terroin and unofficial patriots flit, dim visible, exploratory, far and wide, like night birds on the wing. Of nationals, some three thousand have followed Monda and his general. The rest follow each his own theorem of the uncertainties, theorem that one should march rather with Saint Antoine, innumerable theorems that in such a case the wholesomest were sleep. And so the drums beat in made fits, and the storm bells peal. Saint Antoine itself does but draw out and draw in. Commandant sans terre over there cannot believe that the Marseillese and Saint Marceau will march. Thou laggard sonorous beer vat with a loud voice and timber head, is it time now to palter? Alsatian Westerman clutches him by the throat with drawn sabre, whereupon the timber headed believes. In this manner wanes the slow night amid fret, uncertainty, and toxin all men's humour rising to the hysterical pitch, and nothing done. However, Monda, on the third summons, does come, come unguarded, astonished to find the municipality new. They question him straightly on that mayor's order to resist force by force, on that strategic scheme of cutting Saint Antoine in two halves. He answers what he can, they think it were right to send this strategic national commandant to the abbey prison and let a court of law decide on him. Alas, a court of law, not book law, but primeval club law. Crowds and jostles out of doors, all fretted to the hysterical pitch, cruel as fear, blind as the night. Such court of law and no other clutches poor Monda from his constables beats him down, massacres him, on the steps of the town hall. Look to it, ye new municipals, ye people, in a state of insurrection. Blood is shed, blood must be answered for. Alas, in such hysterical humour, more blood will flow. For it is as with the tiger in that, he has only to begin. Seventeen individuals have been seized in the Champs-Élysées by exploratory patriotism. They flitting dim visible, by it flitting dim visible. Ye have pistols, rapiers, ye seventeen, one of those accursed false patrols that go marauding with anti-national intent, seeking what they can spy, what they can spill. The seventeen are carried to the nearest guardhouse, eleven of them escape by back passages. How is this? Demoiselle Terroin appears at the front entrance with sabre, pistols, and a train, denounces treasonous connivance, demands, seizes the remaining six, that the justice of the people be not trifled with, of which six two more escape in the whirl and debate of the club law court. The last unhappy four are massacred, as Munda was, two ex-bodyguards, one dissipated abbe, one royalist pamphleteer, Sulo, known to us by name, able editor and wit of all work. Poor Sulo, his Acts of the Apostles and brisk placard journals, for he was an able man, come to Fini in this manner, 
and questionable jesting issues suddenly in horrid earnest. Such doings usher in the dawn of the 10th of August, 1792. Or think what a night the poor National Assembly has had, sitting there in great paucity, attempting to debate, quivering and shivering, pointing towards all the thirty-two azimuths at once, as the magnet needle does when thunderstorm is in the air. If the insurrection come, if it come and fail, alas, in that case, may not black courtier with blunderbusses, red Swiss with bayonets, rush over, flushed with victory, and ask us, thou undefinable, water-logged, self-distractive, self-destructive, legislative, what dost thou here unsunk? Or figure the poor national guards bivouacking in temporary tents there, or standing ranked, shifting from leg to leg, all through the weary night, new trickler municipals ordering one thing, old Monda captains ordering another. Procure Manuel has ordered the cannons to be withdrawn from the Pont Neuf. None ventured to disobey him. It seemed certain, then, the old staff, so long doomed, has finally been dissolved in these hours. And Monda is not our commandant now, but Santerre? Yes, friends, Santerre henceforth, surely Monda no more. The squadrons that were to charge see nothing certain, except that they are cold, hungry, worn down with watching, that it were sad to slay French brothers, sadder to be slain by them. Without the Tuileries circuit, and within it, sour uncertain humour sways these men. Only the red Swiss stand steadfast. Them their officers refresh now with a slight wetting of brandy, wherein the nationals, too far gone for brandy, refuse to participate. King Louis, meanwhile, had laid him down for a little sleep. His wig, when he reappeared, had lost the powder on one side. Old Marshal Maillet and the gentleman in black rise always in spirits, as the insurrection does not rise. There goes a witty saying now, the toxin ne rend pas. The toxin, like a dry milk cow, does not yield. For the rest, could one not proclaim martial law? Not easily, for now it seems Mayor Petion is gone. On the other hand, our interim commandant, poor Monda being off to the Hôtel de Ville, complains that so many courtiers in black encumber the service are an eye sorrow to the National Guards, to which Her Majesty answers with emphasis that they will obey all, will suffer all, that they are sure men these. And so the yellow lamplight dies out in the grey of morning in the King's Palace over such a scene, scene of jostling, elbowing, of confusion, and indeed conclusion, for the thing is about to end. Rodeleur and special ministers jostle in the press, consult in side cabinets with one or with both majesties. Sister Elizabeth takes the queen to the window. Sister, see what a beautiful sunrise! Right over the Jacobin church at that quarter. How happy if the toxin did not yield! But Monda returns not. Petion is gone. Much hangs wavering in the invisible balance. About five o'clock there rises from the garden a kind of sound as of a shout to which had become a howl, and instead of Vive le Roi, we're ending in Vive la Nation. Mon Dieu, ejaculates a spectral minister, what is he doing down there? For it is his majesty, gone down with old Marshal Maillet to review the troops. And the nearest companies of them answer so. Her Majesty bursts into a stream of tears. Yet, on stepping from the cabinet, her eyes are dry and calm. Her look is even cheerful. The Austrian lip and the aquiline nose, fuller than usual, gave to her countenance, says Pelletier, something of majesty, which they that did not see her in these moments cannot well have an idea of. O oh, thou Teresa's daughter! King Louis enters, much blown with the fatigue, yet for the rest with his old air of indifference. Of all hopes now, surely the joyfulest were, 
that the toxin did not yield. End of section 52、section、53 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.67 The Swiss. Unhappy friends, the toxin does yield, has yielded. Lo ye how with the first sun rays its ocean tide of pikes and fusils flows glittering from the far east, immeasurable, born of the night. They march there, the grim host, Saint Antoine on this side of the river, Saint Marceau on that, the black browed Marseillaise in the van, with hum and grim murmur far heard, like the ocean tide, as we say, drawn up as if by Luna and influences. From the great deep of waters, they roll gleaming on. No king, Canute or Louis, can bid them roll back. Wide eddying side currents of onlookers roll hither and thither, unarmed, not voiceless. They, the steel host, roll on. New commandant Santerre, indeed, has taken seat at the town hall, rests there in his halfway house. Alsatian Westerman, with flashing sabre, Does not rest, nor the sections, nor the Marseillaise, nor Demoiselle Terroin, but roll continually on. And now, where are Monda's squadrons that were to charge? Not a squadron of them stirs, or they stir in the wrong direction, out of the way. Their officers glad that they will even do that. It is to this hour uncertain whether the squadron on the Pont Neuf made the shadow of resistance. Or did not make the shadow. Enough. The black-browed Marseillaise and Saint Marceau, following them, do cross without let. Do cross in sure hope now of Saint Antoine and the rest. Do billow on towards the Tuileries, where their errand is. The Tuileries, at sound of them, rustles responsive. The red Swiss look to their priming. Courtiers in black draw their blunderbusses, rapiers, poniards. Some have even fire shovels. Every man his weapon of war. Judge if, in these circumstances, Sandic Rodeler felt easy. Will the kind heavens open no middle course of refuge for a poor Sandic who halts between two? If indeed His Majesty would consent to go over to the assembly, His Majesty. Above all, Her Majesty cannot agree to that. Did Her Majesty answer the proposal with a fidonc? Did she say even she would be nailed to the walls sooner? Apparently not. It is written also that she offered the king a pistol, saying, "Now or else never was the time to show himself." Close eye witnesses did not see it, nor do we. That saw only that she was queenlike, quiet. That she argued not, upbraided not, with the inexorable, but like Caesar in the Capitol, wrapped her mantle as it beseems queens and sons of Adam to do. But thou, O Louis, of what stuff art thou at all? Is there no stroke in thee then for life and crown? The silliest hunted deer dies not so. Art thou the languidest of all mortals, or the mildest minded? Thou art the worst starred. The tide advances. Sandic Rodeler and all men's straits grow straighter and straighter. Promescent clangor comes from the armed nationals in the court. Far and wide is the infinite hubbub of tongues. What council? And the tide is now nigh. Messengers, forerunners, speak hastily through the outer grat. Hold parley, sitting astride the walls. Sandic Rodeler goes out and comes in. Cannoneers ask him, "Are we to fire against the people?" King's ministers ask him, "Shall the king's house be forced?" Sandic Rodeler has a hard game to play. He speaks to the cannoneers with eloquence, with fervor, such fervor as a man can, who has to blow hot and cold in one breath. Hot and cold, oh Rodeler! 
we for our part cannot live and die. The cannoneers, by way of answer, fling down their linstocks. Think of this answer, O King Louis and King's ministers, and take a poor Sandique's safe middle course towards the Salle de Manege. King Louis sits, his hands lent on knees, body bent forward, gazes for a space fixedly on Sandic Rodeleur, then answers, looking over his shoulder to the Queen, Marchand. They march, King Louis, Queen, Sister Elizabeth, the two royal children and governess. These, with Sandic Rodeleur and officials of the department, amid a double rank of national guards. The men with blunderbusses, the steady red Swiss, gaze mournfully, reproachfully, but hear only these words from Sandique Rodeleur. The king is going to the assembly. Make way. It has struck eight on all clocks some minutes ago. The king has left the Tuileries forever. O oh, ye staunch Swiss, ye gallant gentlemen in black, for what a cause are ye to spend and be spent? Look out from the western windows, ye may see King Louis placidly hold on his way, the poor little Prince Royal sportfully kicking the fallen leaves. Promescent multitude on the terrace of the Fuyon whirls parallel to him, one man in it, very noisy, with a long pole. Will they not obstruct the outer staircase and back entrance of the salle when it comes to that? King's guards can go no further than the bottom step there. Lo, deputation of legislators comes out. He of the long pole is stilled by oratory. Assembly's guards join themselves to King's guards, and all may mount in this case of necessity. The outer staircase is free or passable. See, royalty ascends. A blue grenadier lifts the poor little Prince Royal from the press. Royalty has entered in. Royalty has vanished forever from your eyes. And ye, left standing there amid the yawning abysses and earthquake of insurrection, without course, without command. If ye perish, it must be as more than martyrs, as martyrs who are now without a cause. The black courtier disappear mostly, through such issues as they can. The poor Swiss know not how to act. One duty only is clear to them, that of standing by their post, and they will perform that. But the glittering steel tide has arrived. It beats now against the chateau barriers and eastern courts, irresistible, loud surging far and wide, breaks in, fills the court of the carousel, black-browed Marseillaise in the van. King Louis gone, say you, over to the assembly. Well and good. But till the assembly pronounce forfeiture of him, what boots it? Our post is in that chateau or stronghold of his. There, till then, must we continue. Think, ye staunch Swiss, whether it were good that grim murder began, and brothers blasted one another in pieces for a stone edifice. Poor Swiss, they know not how to act. From the southern windows some fling cartridges in sign of brotherhood, on the eastern outer staircase and within, through long stairs and corridors, they stand firm-ranked, peaceable, and yet refusing to stir. Westerman speaks to them in Alsatian German. Marseillaise plead in hot Provençal speech and pantomime. Stunning hubbub pleads and threatens, infinite, around. The Swiss stand fast, peaceable and yet immovable, red granite pier in that waste-flashing sea of steel. Who can help the inevitable issue? Marseillaise and all France on this side, granite Swiss on that. The pantomime grows hotter and hotter, Marseillaise sabres flourishing by way of action, the Swiss brow also clouding itself, the Swiss thumb bringing its firelock to the cock, and hark, high thundering above all the din, three Marseillaise cannon from the carousel, pointed by a gunner of bad aim, come rattling over the roofs. Ye Swiss, therefore, fire! The Swiss fire, by volley, by platoon, in rolling fire. Marseillaise men, not a few, 
and a tall man that was louder than any lie silent, smashed upon the pavement. Not a few Marseillais, after the long dusty march, have made halt here. The carousel is void, the black tide recoiling, fugitives rushing as far as Saint Antoine before they stop. The cannoneers without the linstock have squatted invisible and left their cannon, which the Swiss seize. Think what a volley, reverberating doomful to the four corners of Paris and through all hearts, like the clang of Bellona's thongs. The black-browed Marseillaise, rallying on the instant, have become black demons that know how to die. Nor is Brest behind hand, nor Alsatian Westerman. Demoiselle Terroin is Sybil Terroin. Vengeance, victoire ou la mort. From all patriot artillery, great and small, from Fuyon's terrace, and all terraces and places of the widespread insurrectionary sea, there rose responsive a red whirlwind. Blue nationals, ranked in the garden, cannot help their muskets going off against foreign murderers. For there is a sympathy in muskets, in heaped masses of men. Nay, are not mankind in whole, like tuned strings, and a cunning infinite concordance and unity. You smite one string, and all strings will begin sounding, in soft sphere melody, in deafening screech of madness. Mounted gendarmerie, gallop distracted, are fired on merely as a thing running, galloping over the Pont Royal, or one knows not whither. The brain of Paris, brain fevered in the centre of it here, has gone mad, what you call taken fire. Behold, the fire slackens not, nor does the Swiss rolling fire slacken from within. Nay, they clutched cannon, as we saw, and now from the other side they clutch three pieces more, alas, cannon without linstock. Nor will the steel and flint answer, though they try it. Had it chanced to answer, patriot onlookers have their misgivings. One strangest patriot onlooker thinks that the Swiss, had they a commander, would beat. He is a man not unqualified to judge. The name of him is Napoleon Bonaparte. And onlookers and women stand gazing, and the witty Dr. Moore of Glasgow among them, on the other side of the river. Cannon rush rumbling past them, pause on the Pont Royal, belt out their iron entrails there against the Tuileries and at every new belch the women and onlookers shout and clap hands. City of all the devils. In remote streets men are drinking breakfast coffee, following their affairs, with a start now and then as some dull echo reverberates a note louder. And here, Marseilles fall wounded. But Barbaro has surgeons. Barbaro is close by, managing, though underhand and under cover. Marseillais fall death-struck, bequeath their firelock, specify in which pocket are the cartridges, and die murmuring, Revenge me, revenge thy country. Brest Federé officers, galloping in red coats, are shot as Swiss. Lo, you, the carousel has burst into flame, Paris pandemonium. Nay, the poor city, as we said, is in fever fit and convulsion. Such crisis has lasted for the space of some half hour. But what is this that, with legislative insignia, ventures through the hubbub and death hail from the back entrance of the manege, towards the Tuileries and Swiss, written order from His Majesty to cease firing? O oh, ye hapless Swiss, why was there no order not to begin it? Gladly would the Swiss cease firing, but who will bid mad insurrection cease firing? To insurrection you cannot speak, neither can it, hydra-headed, hear. The dead and dying by the hundred lie all around, are borne bleeding through the streets towards help, the sight of them like a torch of the furies, kindling madness. Patriot Paris roars as the bear bereaved of her whelps. On, ye patriots, Vengeance, victory or death. There are men seen who rush on, armed only with walking sticks. 
terror and fury rule the hour. The Swiss, pressed on from without, paralyzed from within, have ceased to shoot, but not to be shot. What shall they do? Desperate is the moment. Shelter or instant death? Yet how? Where? One party flies out by the Rue de l'Echelle, is destroyed utterly on Entier. A second by the other side throws itself into the garden, hurrying across a keen fusillade, rushes suppliant into the National Assembly, finds pity and refuge in the back benches there. The third and largest darts out in column, three hundred strong, towards the Champs-Élysées. Ah, could we but reach Courbevoie, where other Swiss are? Woe! See, in such fusillade, the column soon breaks itself by diversity of opinion into distracted segments, this way and that, to escape in holes, to die fighting from street to street. The firing and murdering will not cease, not yet for long. The red porters of hotels are shot at, be they Suisse by nature, or Suisse only in name. The very firemen who pump and labour on that smoking carousel are shot at. Why should the carousel not burn? Some Swiss take refuge in private houses, find that mercy too does still dwell in the heart of man. The brave Marseillaise are merciful, late so wroth, and labour to save. Journalist Gorsat pleads hard with infuriated groups. Clemence, the wine merchant, stumbles forward to the bar of the assembly, a rescued Swiss in his hand, tells passionately how he rescued him with pain and peril, how he will henceforth support him, being childless himself, and falls a swoon round the poor Swiss's neck amid plaudits. But the most are butchered and even mangled. Fifty, some say fourscore, were marched as prisoners by National Guards to the Hôtel de Ville. The ferocious people bursts through on them in the Place de Grève, massacres them to the last man. O peuple, envy of the universe, peuple in mad Gallic effervescence. Surely few things in the history of carnage are painfuller. What ineffaceable red streak, flickering so sad in the memory, is that of this poor column of red Swiss breaking itself in the confusion of opinions, dispersing into blackness and death. Honour to you, brave men, honourable pity, through long times. Not martyrs were ye, and yet almost more. He was no king of yours, this Louis, and he forsook you like a king of shreds and patches, Ye were but sold to him for some poor sixpence a day. Yet would ye work for your wages, keep your plighted word. The work now was to die, and ye did it. Honour to you, O kinsman, and may the old Deutsch, Biederkeit and Tapferkeit, and valour which is worth and truth, be they Swiss, be they Saxon, fail in no age. Not bastards, true-born were these men. Sons of the men of Sempach, of Myrton, who knelt but not to thee, O Burgundy. Let the traveller, as he passes through Lucerne, turn aside to look a little at their monumental lion, not for Torvalden's sake alone. Hewn out of living rock, the figure sits there by the still lake waters, in lullaby of distant tinkling Lons de Vache, the granite mountains dumbly keeping watch all round and, though inanimate, speaks. End of section 53。section 54 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry。Chapter 2.68 Constitution Burst in Pieces Thus is the 10th of August won and lost. Patriotism reckons it slain by thousand on thousand, so deadly was the Swiss fire from these windows, but will finally reduce them to some 1,200. 
No child's play was it, nor is it. Till two in the afternoon, the massacring, the breaking and the burning has not ended, nor the loose bedlam shut itself again. How deluges of frantic sonscolotism roared through all passages of this Tuileries, ruthless in vengeance. How the valleys were butchered, hewn down, and Dame Compon saw the Marseillaise sabre flash over her head, but the black-browed said, Va-t'en, get thee gone, and flung her from him unstruck. How in the cellars wine-bottles were broken, wine-butts were staved in and drunk, and upwards to the very garrets all windows tumbled out their precious royal furnitures, and with gold mirrors, velvet curtains, down of ripped feather beds, and dead bodies of men, the Tuileries was like no garden of the earth. All this let him who has a taste for it see amply in Mercier, in Acrid Montgaillard, or Beaulieu of the Deux Amis. A hundred and eighty bodies of Swiss lie piled there, naked, unremoved till the second day. Patriotism has torn their red coats into snips, and marches with them at the pike's point. The ghastly bare corpses lie there, under the sun and under the stars, the curious of both sexes crowding to look, which let not us do. Above a hundred carts heaped with dead fare towards the cemetery of St. Madeleine, bewailed, bewept, for all had kindred, all had mothers, if not here, then there. It is one of those carnage fields, such as you read of by the name Glorious Victory, brought home in this case to one's own door. But the black-browed Marseillaise have struck down the tyrant of the chateau. He is struck down, low, and hardly to rise. What a moment for an august legislative was that, when the hereditary representative entered under such circumstances, and the grenadier, carrying the little Prince Royal out of the press, set him down on the assembly table, a moment which one had to smooth off with oratory, waiting what the next would bring. Louis said few words. He was come hither to prevent a great crime. He believed himself safer nowhere than here. President Vergniaud answered briefly, in vague oratory, as we say, about defence of constituted authorities, about dying at our post. And so King Louis sat him down, first here, then there, for a difficulty arose, the constitution not permitting us to debate while the king is present. Finally, he settles himself with his family in the loge of the logograph, in the reporter's box of a journalist, which is beyond the enchanted constitutional circuit, separated from it by a rail. To such lodge of the logograph, measuring some ten feet square, with a small closet at the entrance of it behind, is the king of broad France now limited. Here can he and his sit pent under the eyes of the world, or retire into their closet at intervals for the space of sixteen hours. Such quiet, peculiar moment has the legislative lived to see. But also what a moment was that other few minutes later, when the three Marseillaise cannon went off, and the Swiss rolling fire and universal thunder, like the crack of doom, began to rattle. Honourable members start to their feet, stray bullets singing epicidium, even here, shivering in with window glass and jingle. No, this is our post, let us die here. They sit, therefore, like stone legislators. But may not the lodge of the logograph be forced from behind? tear down the railing that divides it from the enchanted constitutional circuit. Ushers tear and tug, his majesty himself aiding from within. The railing gives way. Majesty and legislative are united in place, unknown destiny hovering over both. Rattle and again rattle went the thunder, one breathless wide-eyed messenger rushing in after another. King's orders to the Swiss went out. It was a fearful thunder, but, as we know, it ended. Breathless messengers, fugitive Swiss, denunciatory patriots, trepidation, finally tripudiation. 
Before four o'clock, much has come and gone. The new municipals have come and gone, with three flags, Liberté, Égalité, Patrie, and the clang of vivats. Vergniaud, he who as president few hours ago talked of dying for constituted authorities, has moved, as committee reporter, that the hereditary representative be suspended, that a national convention do forthwith assemble, to say what further? An able report, which the president must have had ready in his pocket. A president in such cases must have much ready, and yet not ready, and, Janus-like, look before and after. King Louis listens to all, retires about midnight to three little rooms on the upper floor, till the Luxembourg be prepared for him, and the safeguard of the nation. Safer if Brunswick were once here, or alas, not so safe? Ye hapless, discrowned heads! Crowds came next morning to catch a glimpse of them in their three upper rooms. Montgaillard says the august captives wore an air of cheerfulness, even of gaiety, that the Queen and Princess Lombal, who had joined her overnight, looked out of the open window, shook powder from their hair on the people below, and laughed. He is an acrid, distorted man. For the rest, one may guess that the legislative, above all that the new municipality, continues busy. Messengers, municipal or legislative, and swift dispatches rush off to all corners of France, full of triumph, blended with indignant wail, for twelve hundred have fallen. France sends up its blended shout responsive, the 10th of August shall be as the 14th of July, only bloodier and greater. The court has conspired? Poor court, the court has been vanquished, and will have both the scath to bear and the scorn. How the statutes of kings do now all fall. Bronze Henri himself, though he wore a cockade once, jingles down from the Pont Neuf, where Patrie floats in danger. Much more does Louis XIV from the Place Vendôme jingle down, and even breaks in falling. The curious can remark, written on his horse's shoe, 12 août 1692, a century and a day. The 10th of August was Friday, the week is not done, when our old patriot ministry is recalled, what of it can be got. Strict Roland, Genevieve's clavier, had heavy mange the mathematician, once a stone-hewer, and for Minister of Justice, Danton, led hither, as himself says, in one of his gigantic figures, through the breach of Patriot Cannon. These, under legislative committees, must rule the wreck as they can, confusedly enough, with an old legislative waterlogged, with a new municipality so brisk. But National Convention will get itself together, and then... Without delay, however, let a new jury court and criminal tribunal be set up in Paris to try the crimes and conspiracies of the 10th. High Court of Orléans is distant, slow. The blood of the 1,200 patriots, whatever become of other blood, shall be inquired after. Tremble, ye criminals and conspirators, the Minister of Justice is Danton. Robespierre, too, after the victory, sits in the new municipality, insurrectionary improvised municipality, which calls itself Council General of the Commune. For three days now, Louis and his family have heard the legislative debates in the lodge of the Logograph, and retired nightly to their small upper rooms. The Luxembourg, and safeguard of the nation, could not be got ready. Nay, it seems the Luxembourg has too many cellars and issues. No municipality can undertake to watch it. The compact prison of the temple, not so elegant indeed, were much safer. To the temple, therefore. On Monday, 13th day of August, 1792, in Mayor Petion's carriage, Louis and his sad, suspended household fare thither, all Paris out to look at them. As they pass through the Place Vendôme, Louis XIV's statue lies broken on the ground, 
Petion is afraid the queen's looks may be thought scornful and produce provocation. She casts down her eyes and does not look at all. The press is prodigious, but quiet. Here and there it shouts, Vive la nation! but for most part gazes in silence. French royalty vanishes within the gates of the temple, these old peaked towers, like peaked extinguisher, or bonsoir, do cover it up, from which same towers poor Jacques Molay and his Templars were burnt out by French royalty five centuries since. Such are the turns of fate below. Foreign ambassadors, English Lord Gower, have all demanded passports, are driving indignantly towards their respective homes. So then, the Constitution is over? For ever and a day. Gone is that wonder of the universe, first by any old Parliament, waterlogged. Waits only till the Convention come, and will then sink to endless depths. One can guess the silent rage of old constituents, constitution builders, extinct feuillants, men who thought the constitution would march. Lafayette rises to the altitude of the situation at the head of his army. Legislative commissioners are posting towards him and it on the northern frontier to congratulate and perorate. He orders the municipality of Sedan to arrest these commissioners and keep them strictly in ward as rebels till he say further. The Sedan municipals obey. The Sedan municipals obey, but the soldiers of the Lafayette army? The soldiers of the Lafayette army have, as all soldiers have, a kind of dim feeling that they themselves are sans culotte in buff belts, that the victory of the 10th of August is also a victory for them. They will not rise and follow Lafayette to Paris. They will rise and send him thither. On the 18th, which is but next Saturday, Lafayette, with some two or three indignant staff officers, one of whom is old constituent Alexandre de la Mette, having first put his lines in what order he could, rides swiftly over the marches towards Holland rides, alas, swiftly into the claws of Austrians. He, long wavering, trembling on the verge of the horizon, has set in Olmut's dungeons. This history knows him no more. Adieu, thou hero of two worlds, thinnest but compact honour-worthy man. Through long rough night of captivity, through other tumults, triumphs and changes, thou wilt swing well, fast anchored to the Washington formula, and be the hero and perfect character, were it only of one idea. The Sedan municipals repent and protest. The soldiers shout, Vive la nation! De Murier Polymetus, from his camp at Molde, sees himself made commander-in-chief. And, O Brunswick, what sort of military execution will Paris merit now? Forward, ye well-drilled exterminatory men, with your artillery wagons and camp kettles jingling. Forward, tall chivalrous king of Prussia, fanfaronading emigrants and war god Broglie, for some consolation to mankind, which verily is not without need of some. End of section 54 End of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle